I will start with my presentation, I guess. All right, can everybody see that? I'm gonna say yes. All right, sweet. So, um, welcome to the Western Herald Photography Workshop. Um, I kind of just want to go through like a little about what, what we are. Um, you're all good, Chloe. Um, what we are, what we do, who I am, and uh, then we can like do some like what is photography. Um, so who is, what is Western Herald Photo? Uh, we help tell the stories that WMU has to offer. Um, I think that's a, a goal of the Western Herald too. Um, we just help with the visual aspect of that. Um, and then we cover events and stories that Western Herald reporters are working on. Um, there's tons of opportunities that we have. Have um, gone to concerts, we've gone to political events like the swearing in of the new Kalamazoo mayor, um, Bernie Sanders rallies. There's a tons of sporting events. Like right now, every I think every sport but football is being played. So that's super fun. And uh, then we're trying to incorporate more creative opportunities like photo stories. Um, just trying to get people to be more uh, comfortable with like sharing the creative side at, at a news uh, organization. Um, about me, uh, this is my second year as the photo editor at Western Herald. Um, this is, I'm a senior, it's my fourth and final year at Western. Um, I'm a freshwater science and sustainability major, so nothing to do with photography, but I've been doing photography for about eight years. Um, started on an iPhone, I made an Instagram, and that's how I got my start. Um, and then I was, I joined my high school yearbook and then I was able to use their gear, which really helped me jump up on my game. Um, and then what up Joe? What up? <laughs> and then I became the editor of that yearbook. And so that kind of helped me become, um, Western Herald and how I came to Herald is actually pretty funny. Um, I posted some photos that I took for a like a, an environment class of just like around campus uh, that I had to put in a presentation for that class. And I posted them on Twitter and Western WMU actually wanted to repost them. So that I said, of course, like I, I want, of course I want you to do that. And so I did and then uh, the sports editor at the time, a former editor in chief, uh, Sam, like DM'd me immediately and was like, "We need you in the Western Herald. We want you here." And <laughs> um, just like calling back and forth over like winter break and rest is uh, kind of history. Before I got here, there was no photo uh, or photo section, so um, that's been like a project over the past year to make a lasting photo section legacy to stay with the Herald because photography is such an important aspect of journalism now. Um, I Lastly, I guess I'm self-taught and I've never taken a photo class. So we'll see how I'm good at teaching I am, but I think I can... I think we can do good. So, um, so to start, I just want to go over the basics. Um, we're going to do like exposure camera modes for like, if you're shooting on a DSLR, um, and some composition. And I, I think that gear, like you can get, have the best camera, but Nothing. You're not going to get very far without a basic understanding of this stuff. And I think it's all relative, too. Once you know this stuff, you can break break the so-called rules of photography. 
So it's, it's all just understanding this stuff first. So exposure. Um, when people say, photographers say exposure, we mean like, we mean three things. We mean aperture, uh, shutter speed, and ISO. So um, you see on the right here, exposure, it, or exposure is made of three things. Um, and so aperture, the first thing, is also called f-stop. And that's how much light go, your lens will let in. Um, and then you can see that on the right here, that the, the lower your F number, that's the more light that is going to come in. Um, and it also determines how much is in focus. So when you have a really, we call it a wide aperture or a low F number, not a lot is in focus. And then when there's a high number um, or a small aperture, everything is in focus. And so that's also going to, like, that determines how much light is also coming in and um, touching your camera sensor. And so this also uh, plays a part in shutter speed. And shutter speed is how fast your camera can take a picture. Um, so the faster you want to take a picture, the less light that will reach your camera sensor, too. Um, so when you're let's say you're taking pictures of sports, you're going to want a fast shutter speed because these people are running around and you need to stop, you want to stop their movement. Uh, let's say you're taking a photo at night, there's not, there's not a lot of light for you to, um, to work with. So you're going to need a slower shutter speed to gather enough light to make your, um, your photo come out how you'd like. Um, and then ISO is kind of like a third, it's like 2B, you know, like it's after aperture and shutter speed, you can think about it third. And so it's how sensitive your camera sensor to light. So if you can't get a balanced exposure, and by that I mean like a, just like a, like a good photo, it's not too bright, it's not too dark. Um, you can use ISO to uh, affect that. So if your if your um, if your photos too coming out too dark, even with like a the aperture and shutter speed you think you you'd like to shoot with, then you would raise your ISO number to a higher number like ISO two thousand if you're if it's pretty dark. Um, if your photos too bright, then you would you're going to decrease your ISO. And ISO also plays a role in, uh, it, it can uh, make things more noisy or grainy. So if you have a high ISO, it looks more grainy. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. And then just changing any one of these three elements is going to change the exposure of your photo. If you just change one at a time, I think playing around with each one is important to understanding what's going to come out of your camera when you take a picture. Um, now this, this is just like another way to look at the exposure kind of, it's called the, like the exposure triangle. And so you can just see like the slower your shutter gets, the brighter your photo is going to be. The more open and lower F number that your aperture is, the brighter your photo is going to be. And the higher your ISO is, the brighter your photo is going to be and vice versa. So usually it's uh, just trying to find a balance in between all of these, oh, like turned off here, um, that is going to get you the correct exposure that you want. Um, next I have is understanding, oh, if you guys have any questions at any time at all, just interrupt me. and that's fine. Um, I'm going to talk about camera modes next. Um, so first we have like auto mode, which this is, uh, that's like everything is done for you. 
And I think the best thing to improve your photography is to be comfortable out of auto mode. And that's what we want you to be able to achieve like with Western Herald. And just as a photographer in general, you want to be not having to use auto mode. Um, on the on the upper right here, I have just like this. This is the dial on like most. It's on a Canon camera, um, and I think that the arrow, the far the direction here is just how difficult it is to shoot in each of these modes. Um, so program the next the next uh, setting is it it is just the aperture and shutter for you, but you're able to control like uh, ISO, white balance, and if the flash fires um, yourself. It's basically a glorified auto. Doesn't do, the camera's doing most of the work for you. Um, next is a TV or shutter priority. And the shutter speed you set yourself for this. So if you want a desired shutter speed, let's say you want it to stay at um, one one thousandth of a second then you would set it to that and then the camera will figure out the best aperture and maybe even the ISO to achieve that shutter speed and get you a balanced exposure. Um, next is AV or aperture priority and this is my personal favorite and that's how I it kind of all clicked with me due to because of this one. Um, you choose your desired aperture while the camera chooses your shutter speed. And so these are these like TV and AV are great to like learn on because you can you not you don't have to think about every aspect of the photo or the the camera settings. Um, you can choose one thing that you want to stay the same and then the camera will figure out the rest of it. Um, I still shoot an aperture priority for some things. If um like if I'm shooting if I have a second camera on me, I have like one camera with a big lens and one with a wide lens. I always keep the wide lens one in aperture priority because I might not be I'm not gonna be using the wide lens ones very often. I'm gonna if I want to take a picture fast, I don't wanna have to change my all of my settings with, to take that picture. I wanna be able to put it up to my eye, shoot it, and get something good. And then finally is manual mode, which is um, that you're going to adjust the aperture, adjust the shutter speed and ISO, and it's all to you. Um, and you, there's like some, some um, like meter in there that tells you if it, your exposure is balanced or not. And then I just wanted to go over like iPhone photography just really quickly because I think we all have a phone um, or just cell phone photography. Um, I think it's important to turn on the grid lines here on your phone. I think uh, those are, we're going to talk about composition, I think right after this. But um, like turning on the grid lines helps you. Uh, set your composition or your photo up a little more uh you think about it more i guess would be the right way to say that um for news you probably we're going to want you to take uh hold it horizontally um i don't i think there's definitely a place for vertical photos and news but for if we're taking pictures of stories with a phone then that cover photo has to be horizontal um, just some things that I like to do. I like to use the volume button for my shutter button. It makes it more like a like a camera. Um, you can also use volume buttons of your headphones to take pictures. So you could uh, you can be pretty discreet taking pictures with a cell phone if you wanted to be. Um, you can adjust exposure by um, taking your phone and then focusing and I'm not sure you can see that but moving it up so your exposure goes up 
or down. Um, and then just always try and keep it steady. And with uh, our phones, which might be going in pockets and places where they can get dirty, just make sure you have a clean lens when you're, or you can just wipe off with your shirt or whatever if you're taking pictures with your phone. Um, so composition, which composition is, it's, it's hard. <laughs> I'm going to go over some of like the, the most, the basic ones. Um, but just always keep them in mind that these are just, these are rules to know and then to break. Uh, it's all figurative. So the classic rule of thirds, which is like, um, the grid that you can turn on your phone, you can turn on your camera. Um, it's the theory that if you place points of interest at the intersections of this grid, um, the photo becomes more balanced and will enable a viewer um, of the image to interact it more naturally. Um, kind of goes with the theory that we, we read images. So we read left to right, we, we're going to look at pictures from left to right too. And so it's just about placing things like strategically in photos to make them look, be able to read easier and come off more interesting. Um, and it makes you think about what, what are the points of interest in the photo and where am I intentionally placing things in this photo. So here are a couple examples of my photos that I thought were uh, good for rule of thirds. Um, you see in this left one, we have stuff from, it's right to left here, but each, there's um, points of the photo that want to bring attention to. Um, this was from when people, when the uh, court case for Breonna Taylor was decided, I think that was in, must have been September. And they, this was outside the Kalamazoo County Courthouse. Um, you can just see that people, the people on the right here, closer are closer, and then it, you want to move towards the middle. And um, I like the Black Lives Matter sign up here in the direct middle. And each intersection. Thanks, Chloe. Thanks for coming. Um, And each section of like the section here has a um, like an important point and then the middle and we even have some leading lines here which are nice to incorporate in your pictures and that'll make your eyes want to go to a certain point. Um, this is the leader of the protest there so I wanted to highlight his um, his involvement and then on the right here, we have uh, Waldo Library. I think it's just, it's nice to, if you're not taking pictures of things that are inherently interesting, um, it's nice to like keep things not centered. Um, and you like, you read this image and you're like, oh, there's Waldo Library. <laughs> um, got some fall foliage in here just to add um, some, some things to the top and the side here. So each like third of this photo is completely different than um, the other third. Next, I'm gonna tell you to throw out everything you know about uh, the rule of thirds and just put things in the middle and be symmetrical. Um, symmetry has a great place in photography. Um, it makes its pew. Why would you not want to look at something that's symmetrical? It looks great. Um, and so like putting something in the middle, it, it draws your attention right to it. You can't miss it. Like this photo of Bernie, I don't know how I line this up with the signs here, but he's right in the middle. You know, you know, that's Bernie and you can't miss it. Um, you also got to be careful because if you rely on symmetry and um, centering things too much, you are going to get stuck in that. I can definitely attest to being like 
why is my photo just centered composition and it, it's boring and I could have done it better. Um, foreground and background interest is my personal favorite to mess around with. Um, this photo is by our um, former assistant, Rodney. Um, and you see just this was on election day. And in this side, we have the vote. And there's a line of people trying to sign up to be able to vote on election day. And so it's it incorporates details that are important to, to express in, but it puts them, instead of taking two photos, like one of the sign and one of the line, you can put it together and makes it a more interesting and, fo and like storytelling photo. Um, it adds depth, which I think is really important, especially if you're using like, you can use a wide angle lens, like in this photo to do that, or you can use um, like a zoom lens to do that too which I'll show some examples of in a second. Um, so here, in this first one on the left, it's sort of like the Waldo Library one. Um, I use the fall foliage here to add some color and some, like, some framing to uh, frame Sprow. Um, I don't think that I meant to have it centered, but it just ended up like that. Um, and then this one of uh, Caleb Ellaby, WMU's quarterback, I liked because he's just practicing on the sideline here, but you can, um, I used a long lens to show the person that he was practicing with. And then you can really use um, like foreground uh, focus to um, add to the, your subject. So this girl, I wanted to be the main focus of this picture, but I have the rest of the, um, the I think was a, this was a climate protest. Uh, and I have the rest of the climate protest is framed around her. Juxtaposition. This is probably one of the, the this is like the toughest one. Um, this, I saw this, this is after the election results were decided. Um, but it's to have two or more elements in a scene that can either contrast with each other or complement each other. Um, and I think that's super important to realize in photojournalism because you can tell a huge story finding things that go together or uh, are completely different. Um, obviously, this was after the results were decided, so President Trump was on his supposed to be on his way out um, of the White House here, and uh, Evan, I think Gucci for AP, I, re I retweeted this when I saw it because it, it's just a it's using your surroundings to create a picture that um, normally wouldn't have been thought of. Um, so for pho photojournalism specifically, I think I came up with this, these five points. You should plan your shots. You should anticipate your, your shots, know your stuff. Um, your details in, or details are important and persistence is very key. So and what I mean by anticip anticipate is, um, oh, did I skip one? Oh, I did. What I mean by plan is um, photojournalism is rarely about capturing unexpected events. You're usually going to be assigned something, and you're going to go there and take pictures for it. Um, and so you're, you're going to want to know what you're in for. You, if you're going to a sporting event, then you're going to want... Uh, a long lens and a camera that can shoot uh, very fast photos. If you're going to a um, a news event or like a political rally, anything like that, you're gonna want probably a wider wider angle lens um, and a camera that can that you know in and out because something th things are gonna happen probably uh, quickly and you're not gonna be able to really 
plan around what's going to happen. Um, and so I like to think about like who's going to be at the event. Um, if it's like a universe, a Western event, like which faculty members and board members are going to be there? Should I like should I be taking their picture? Um, and I always come to in with a couple photos in mind for a shoot. Um, like I want to be here when this happens, and but really, if if it's if you get there and it doesn't happen or that photo doesn't come out like you want it to, just um, go where your eyes take you, um, because that's really what's gonna. Um, when you do that, that's what's gonna make the best of the situation that you're in. Um, don't try. Don't sit in the same spot. Move around. Yeah. Um, I think another important thing is to anticipate. Um, you're like if you know something's gonna happen, take photos so you know what settings are the appropriate ones um, before that thing happens. So if you're at an event then or you're out shooting and you know something's gonna um, happen, you should be taking pictures uh, before that so then you know you got you your settings are ready and you're you're ready um, when that uh, specific action or whatever is going to happen happens. Um, I think photojournalism and photography in general are all about moments and you don't want to miss those moments fiddling with your camera. Um, and that's one of the things that you can do like with your camera modes, like manual mode, it's going to stay, your camera is going to stay in the same settings all the time. So you can kind of judge what settings you're going to need and um, you won't have to be fiddling around with your camera settings when something happens. Um, I put this picture on this slide because what this is, this guy is doing and what it's called, the photo community calls this chimping. And it's when you, when you take a picture and immediately look at the screen to, to check if you got your photo right. And so what's, what's going to happen if you get in the, like, uh, if you find yourself doing this is you're going to, look up and then something's going to be happening that you should have been taking a picture of all along when the photo you got isn't even the best one. Um, so I think just anticipating the shot and there's a time and place to be looking through your photos, but if some, if stuff's going on, you should probably just trust that you, you're taking the photos correctly and, um, just trust yourself to get, to get the shot. Um, next is know your gear, know your surroundings and know the people around you. Um, I think knowing your gear is huge. Like you should be able to change the settings in the dark. Uh, it's do a, change your lenses in the dark, stuff like that, that I have found that I like to, if when I'm taking night pictures, I think it's nice to not have to be, take a flashlight out and look at my camera to know what buttons I'm pushing and what happens. And that just comes with experience and knowing your, knowing your stuff. Um, like the fanciest new camera is going to fail you if you don't know how to use it when the camera you've always been using, um, you know, the ins and outs of, um, so like I get like, just don't, take your like a new don't test things on something that is has like an assignment that holds weight to it you know if you're just messing around then go for it but if you're you're relying on this camera to do get the job done with you then you don't want to uh, be relying on a new camera to do that um, Know your surroundings. This goes back to anticipate, and you just want to know where where to be when a specific thing happens. Um, I like to pay attention if I'm shooting something new to where there's usually pro photographers there. Look at them and just see what they're doing. 
even introduce yourself because, and that goes to the next point, just like I'm with Western Herald or I'm, I'm Spencer, like they're going to be, usually they're going to be nice to you and they're going to be like, uh, and treat you with respect. So they can tell it, teach you a lot and just paying attention to what other people are doing and where they're going is really important. Um, and then knowing the people around you, like I said before, just identify rele relevant people um, to a story and the story you're trying to tell. So if I'm trying to uh, take pictures of a story about construction on Western's campus, then I'm going to want to identify like workers on the construction site rather than just a boring photo of the building. I'd like to have like people that are actually in it. Um, I think back to sports again, just identifying, um, <clears throat> excuse me, like coaches and coaching staff. Um, those are important people to know who they are, where they're going to be, and you're able to catch their uh, emotions and moments um, while trying to be discreet too. So <laughs> I just said this, but uh, the de the details of photojournalism, I think, are capturing emotions um, and being able to tell. I think storytelling has to do a lot with like close ups and the details of things because you can like get a wide angle of a scene, but if you're focusing on the details, that's going to tell a lot more of the important parts of a story. Um, I think being approachable but invisible is a good thing for anything in photography. Um, you don't want to be looking like a weirdo <laughs> but with a camera in your hand, but you want to be invisible and just being confident with your camera. Um, I think that's huge, just being confident with your camera, actually. Just act like you know what you're doing, even if you don't. You're not there to, you're there to do your job and um, just walking in like you own the place, but you're just going to be back getting your the photos you want to. And then I think listening to um, just what's going on, pay, just paying attention in general is um don't be so focused in on one aspect of something going on. I didn't sound right, but don't just don't focus on one thing the entire time. Just be att att paying attention to your surroundings, and that'll get you very far. And I think persistence is the biggest key to photography. Like you can't. Um, not every photo you're gonna make is gonna be perfect, and Honestly, like a, a, so many of my photos are bad. And, I, and so I think it's good to keep in mind that artists only show what they want you to see. You only see their final portfolio. They probably have a 10,000 photos and here's 30 that they think are good enough to show you. So I think practicing and you got to just be able to identify the great from the bad. And uh, I think that's what we can do here at Western Herald Photo, and I can help you with um, learning from what you did wrong uh, when you're just starting out is going to help you so much. And even when you're not <laughs> just starting out, um, you know, getting a critique or something like that is going to make you go very far. And then I think just getting out and shoot is going to help you grow a ton. You practice just like anything else, you're going to get better. Um, I think working your way up to better gear is a, that's something I had to do. I shot it, like I said, I started on an iPhone and I used like my mom's really old camera. Um, and then I was able to start using the gear at my high school yearbook. And so, but that was like a span of like five years or six years, something like that. So just um, working your way up to better gear 
I think you can kind of decide when a camera is not like I've moved beyond this. Like I am, I am, I know my camera this well and, um, it's, I want to create stuff that it can't do anymore. And so I think that's like a good judgment call of when you need to get better gear. Um, and I think that confining yourself in the beginning is actually a great way to learn and grow. Like, using only one lens, forcing yourself to use only one lens. And that's what I think iPhones are great for. You can only use the the few, I mean, they have more cameras now on them, but like one lens on there. Um, only shooting in black and white is a great, um, great thing that you have to understand what's going to stand out when there's no color in there. Um, only shooting night photos, that's always tough. You're going to have to use like a tripod and that's going to constrain yourself and it's going to help you grow and learn a lot about your camera and stuff like that. I think another, the last important thing is to have fun. Don't, don't lose sight of that. And, um, this, that's what photography is supposed to be in my mind. And that's why I've always, I've loved it. Um, and don't, don't let it like take over so much that it's not fun and don't think too much into stuff. Uh, to finish up, I just wanted to uh, show some of my favorite uh, photographers like on Instagram right now. Um, we could get into like historical photographers, but I just figured these are people that you guys can go and look up like right now on Instagram. Um, here, the ones with their uh, actual username showing are like the photojournalism ones that I really like. Um, Isaac Ritchie, he was the, he's a past, he's a CMU photojournalist. Um, and I think he's graduated now, but he was the, the, editor-in-chief of CM Life 2 last semester and he's just super good at um, telling stories he's really involved in with the sports and like I think friends with a lot of the people like football players and stuff like that so he's really good at like showing their emotions and getting into um, situations that allow him to tell like different sides of them different stories of these players, um, something that I have not been able to do. So I think it's it's really cool to see his uh, take on that. Um, Joe Bissell, he works for MLive here in Kalamazoo. He's just really, he's really good at um, setting up a scene. Um, I think his, his colors are always awesome. It's fun to see that. Um, color incorporation in the photos and stuff. Um, Washington Post photo, that's just like all of the Washington Post team. Um, I think they just post their best to that account. So that's just great to see like photos from everywhere. It's not a specific city. Uh, they're not specifically shooting uh, the same thing. And it's just photos from everywhere. So that's a great uh, great way to see like how photographers are shooting stuff, uh, shooting certain events. Uh, Paul Nicklin is a na National Geographic photographer. He's uh, very much into conservation around like Arctic wild wildlife. Uh, I think that he has some just um, some emotional like raising shots and just uh, he's really good at playing with the emotions and capturing that. Um, and then, uh, photo Dre here, uh, he's based out of New York. He's, uh, I think he's all film and he does all of his own printing and stuff like that. Um, I think he really is important to capture like a, the black photographer's experience, um, in this day and age. So 
he, I always am paying close attention to his work. It's really great. Um, on my personal favorites, um, on the kind of artsy side of things, I have uh, Alex Stroll on the left, left top over here. Very famous and uh, adventure photographer. He's been everywhere. If you hear about people going to a place, he's been there five years ago. You know, so um, I think he's just really great at capturing his breathtaking scenes and providing um, human elements in the these scenes that look otherworldly. Um, the bottom right here is uh, Ruben Wu, and he does a lot of uh, light painting and landscape type stuff. It's very futuristic looking and he actually like programs drones to do light painting for him and I think that's just like over the top crazy. Um, other two I won't go into but there are some local uh, like Detroit artists that uh, I think are really cool about using color and stuff like that. Um, if you guys have any of your favorites, definitely let me know. I'd love to talk about uh, your photography. And if you have questions, um, you should like definitely speak up or put them in the chat. And I'd love to just talk photo with you guys. Let me stop my share. Quick question. What's up, Brady? All right. Um. So, can you hear me fine? Or is it yeah, I can up? hear you. All right. Uh, cause I know. Um, one time I was at a basketball game with Sam, and he had me take a picture of like uh of the coach and the um, I believe it was like someone on the athletic director board. Um, how do you how do you kind of go about taking those kind of pictures? You know, you don't want to be like you know secretive taking them. Um, but at the same time, I didn't want to kind of invade. I mean, I guess that's kind of what photojournalism is, kind of like <laughs> invading. Some people's privacy to a certain extent but i just didn't really know how to go about that so i don't know if like maybe you can share an experience with me maybe how how you do it or something like that um yeah that was a uh, kathy beauregard so she's the president of athletics um i kind of you know i've gotten yelled at i've gotten like con confronted and it's it's not easy to it's sometimes you're a little taken aback and you're but you're you also have to like you're doing your job and if they're if someone's in a public space you're allowed to um take their picture and uh, like if they're on a city street that like, you have every right to be um taking their picture like don't be you obviously like you said don't invade their privacy but um if you're just trying like taking pictures of like steve hawkins like you like you were then I think if they're attending that basketball game, then you have every right to be um, taking pictures of them. They're part of the basketball culture um, and WMU culture. So it's important to um, be capturing like that they were there and that we can reference them in a story later. Is that uh is that a good, is it, does that answer your question? Definitely. All right. Yeah. Cause I just think it's, it's important that even if you are confronted, don't put, don't let that put you down because you're there doing your job and they're there doing their job most of the time. Um, just, just take it with stride and you can usually just, um, usually like an ethics call. You can just uh, do what you want to an extent. Um, Annika, for the photo story, I suppose I might take pictures. I'm swiping the card into the dying zone. Or someone studying at the library. Um, in that case, I would add, ask for permission. Usually students, um, they, I've had, I usually don't have any problems. You can just be like, do you mind if I swipe your card or if do you mind if I take a picture of you swiping your card or like if they don't have headphones in at the library, 
Um, just ask them, like, could I take your picture? I'm with the Western Herald. My name's Annika. Um, and just kind of explain what you're, what you're wanting to do with the picture. Um, I think it just depends if you're trying to take a picture of just them or, like, the library in general. If you're taking a picture of the library in general, you don't need to ask permission of everybody in that picture. But if you're taking, trying to get a picture of like a specific person, it's good to um, ask them, tell them what you're up to, and then a ask for their name, major, and uh, their year at Western. It's always good details because those can be used in the story. Yeah, Joel, that's a good point. Uh, there's someone of importance they should know. It's yeah. I don't know. I have a question. Well, another question. Um, <laughs> if we're kind of like for people who um who are just getting into it, how long? Would you say it takes to really um develop an eye for what photos to get? Um, that's a that's a hard question. <laughs> um, I we usually like to do like we 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 talked about with this with you last year. I uh, like. We like to do the two shadows with like a what like a with me or my or an assistant, um, so they so people know what to look out for. As for like developing an eye, um, I don't know if there's like a specific timeline for that. Um, I would say. It's probably long, uh, but I'd say like probably like five to ten events is like probably what you're going to start understanding, like going away from just like the immediate good photos. You're going to like start making things happen on your own is going to be so probably like a couple months if like if you have the right people helping you and teaching you. Yeah, each event is very different. So yeah, like if you're like, if you're focusing just on uh, basketball, you're probably going to go there a few times and start realizing, start nailing the shots and start doing your own thing. Um, but it's also good to like diversify what you're taking pictures of because then you know um, what looks good and what we're expecting, what what I or I don't know, what what makes a good cover for a story and stuff like that. Um, yeah. I mean I don't know how long Sometimes you just have like a natural eye and you know what looks good. Sometimes it takes a really long time to know to be putting that stuff together. You guys have any uh, photographers that you look to for? inspiration or you really like their work I've seen this one guy uh, I think his name is like Jody picks I think or something like that he's from uh he's from Detroit it's like Jody picks he does like it's not really a uh, photojournalism but he does more so like uh, I guess you could say like Mm, landscaping uh, photography, I guess you could say. Yeah, I'm gonna look at my right now. Actually. Yeah, I could uh, send the page in this group chat in the group chat if you want me to too. But 
This should be probably pretty easy to find. Is uh like Joe and then Y and then D picks. Joey Joey D picks. Oh yeah, I sh I found him. Yeah, I like his work. Um, I don't know if you know who the well you probably yeah you know him probably uh, the Detroit photographer of uh, Valandis. Yeah. Seen his work. I like his work too. Yeah, I love I love uh. <laughs> He's, yeah, uh, yeah. I watch his videos too. He's pretty cool. Pretty cool dude. It seems like. Yeah, if you want uh, some raw, like reactions to photo, like photography around, like Instagram and stuff, he's mm -hmm. good. he's good for that. Yeah, he's gonna tell you like and how that, it is, and I think that's great. <laughs> You you probably seen him too, the guy uh William, I think like Verdeck or something like that. Yeah, Ver yeah. Yeah, his his yeah. his work's pretty cool too. Got that film going. Yeah. I, I'm not super familiar with his work, but yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. Um mm. but yeah. So I wish that we were able to like meet and go out and shoot, but that got shut down uh, pretty quickly when it was when we were trying to do that. Because um, I'd love to just go around campus and take pictures and run through the 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 paces. But if anyone uh, like does want to shoot in person, I'm definitely always open. Um, I like going downtown. I'm more of a landscape photographer, but, um, yeah, I just, I love a good picture. Um, so if there's no other questions, um, we can end it here. Uh, and then... I'm always open to get emails, texts, whatever you want to send me, and I can help out. However I, however I can help out, I will. So thanks for everybody coming, and I hope you have a good Friday. Thanks, Spence. Have a great Friday. Thanks for coming, Joelle. Thanks, Spencer. This was awesome. Thanks, Aya. All right, end the recording. Where did I go? What the fuck?